بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد Surely all praises belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the creator, the sustainer and the controller of all that happens in the universe and we invoke his peace and blessings upon his noble messenger, his family, his companions, and all those who follow them in righteousness until the end of time. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today, inshallah, we will take a look at a hadith that, at least in the view of some people, creates some problems for Muslims. And that is the hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ referred to women as being deficient in intelligence and religion. Deficient in intelligence and in religion. And of course, when we read this translation or the Arabic hadith, the Arabic text, we automatically assume that deficient in intelligence means that women are less intelligent than men. That's what comes to mind. But if that is indeed what the Prophet ﷺ meant, then we have a major problem. And that problem is that Allah did not create two genders that are equal before Him. <coughs> it would obviously mean that the male is superior to the female. If deficiency in intelligence and religion, as mentioned in the hadith, means that women are truly less intelligent and not to the level of men in terms of their worship of Allah and their religion, then Obviously, the male gender is better and superior. And if we believe that, then we have to believe that God Almighty is unjust and unfair. Because He has created women inferior to men. This, of course, is absolutely false. Because we have explored before the equality of the genders before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah An-Nisa in the very first ayah, Ya ayyuha nas ittaqu rabbakum alladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahida wa khalaqa minha zawjaha. This statement, wa khalaqa minha zawjaha, is the dalil, the evidence that before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's too loud maybe the volume needs to be turned down a bit uh, maybe I am uh, you know my voice my voice is uh, louder or stronger thank you when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said he created from it its companion the lesson here is that we're equal Because Eve was created from Adam's body. And there is no way Adam could claim or argue that he is better than any other part of his body. You cannot say that I am better than my hand. Or that I am better than my feet. Your hands and your feet are part of you. In fact, they complete you. And you cannot separate them. And so in this statement alone, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us no reason, no justification to even debate this issue of whether one gender is better than the other or superior to the other. He ends that discussion right then and there by creating Eve from the body of Adam alayhi <clears throat> salam. So we believe as Muslims, brothers and sisters, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not unjust. That He is Al-Adl, the just one. 
In fact, you and I as Muslims, such issues, especially when we come across a hadith or an ayah of the Quran that may seem at face value to create these issues, here are certain concepts we need to be aware of. Number one, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just and He never does any injustice to any creature. A Muslim should have absolute conviction in this. There is no room for any doubts or confusion on this matter. That Allah is just and never does any injustice to any creature. And the evidence for this is from the Quran, the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Himself. In many ayats in the Quran, in Surah Qaf, for example, Allah says, وَمَا أَنَا بِظَلَّامٍ لِلْعَبِيدٍ Allah says, and I, Allah, I am not one to oppress or to commit injustice to any of my servants. In Surah Ali Imran, Allah tells us, إِنَّ اللَّهَ الْآآآ وَاللَّهُ لَا يُرِيدُ ظُلْمًا لِلْعَالَمِينَ And Allah does not want any injustice, any oppression, any uh, transgression lil alamin for the whole universe not just for human beings for the whole universe so the very nature of god almighty of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brothers and sisters is such that he does not do any injustice he is not unjust to any creature period so when we're confronted with such issues this is the first concept we need to understand clearly and have conviction about. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just and never does any injustice. Which would mean that the hadith or the ayah that seems to say otherwise must have some other explanation or some other meaning. Because this reality, this truth that Allah the exalted, the creator, does not do injustice at all cannot be changed. Throughout time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has always been just. He has never changed. These are qualities that have never changed. God does not change. Why? Because He is eternal. He has been the first and will, and will be there. He has no beginning, no end. No beginning, no end. So he doesn't change. Because change implies what? It implies a beginning of something and, and an end to it. So the first thing is, Allah is just, never commits any injustice to any creature. If we, if we have conviction of this, then it, the hadith in question or the verse in question must have some other explanation. It must have some other explanation. The average person, usually non-Muslims, but even some Muslims uh, fall into this category. The average person tends to use his or her intellect as the final judge over everything else. But what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us as Muslims is that it is not the intellect that is the final judge. It is the revelation that is the final judge. It is God Almighty who is the final judge. In other words, our intellect, brothers and sisters, cannot override the revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The revelation can override our judgment, our intellect. Our intellect is subject to the revelation, not the other way around. But our intellect does have an important role to play in understanding this revelation, but not in abrogating the revelation. So one problem we confront on such issues, when the average person reads such a statement, such a hadith, for example, the initial assumption is that God is wrong. But why can it not be that our understanding is wrong? Why does it have to be that God is wrong? 
In fact, as Muslims, we know that God cannot be wrong. And if God is not wrong, then something else is. <clears throat> and it cannot be His revelation, because it's coming from Him. It cannot be the hadith that is authentic, because that is also coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which leaves us with the fact that either our understanding is wrong, or there is some piece of information that we're missing regarding this hadith or this statement that seems to create the confusion. So as Muslims, these are concepts that we must understand. See, the Muslim views everything else through these lens. <coughs> That's how we view things. So let us talk about the actual hadith and the statement of the Prophet ﷺ. As I explained, when the Prophet says deficiency or deficient in intelligence, it cannot mean that women are inferior in their intelligence to men. And I'll, I'll, share, you, I'll share with you some examples. First of all, this, this statement in the hadith, when the Prophet mentioned it, a lady asked the Prophet ﷺ, and in some hadith, they, as a group, they asked him, what is our deficiency in, in aql? What is our deficiency in the aql that you're talking about, in intelligence? He said, alayhi salam, isn't it true that the testimony of one of you is half that of a man? <coughs> that is, if one woman test if the testimony of one woman is equal to half of a man, it means you need two women to equal one man. Now this statement in the hadith refers to a particular ayah in the Qur'an, in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 282, which by the way happens to be the longest ayah in the Qur'an. It's the longest verse in the Qur'an. But go back and read that verse, brothers and sisters. And one of the things you'll realize is that in that verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about a specific situation. The problem is we generalize it. We generalize it. Now you might, uh, you might say to me, well, how do you assume in the hadith that it's specific and it's not general? My answer is, Al-Hafidh ibn Hajar, rahimahullah, because this is a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, and he did an explanation of Sahih al-Bukhari. In commenting on this hadith, he said, rahimahullah, <coughs> that the statement of the Prophet here, isn't it true that this, the testimony of a woman is half that of a man? Ibn Hajar rahimahullah said that this statement is in reference to this ayah in Surah Al-Baqarah. So even he understood that this, uh, this statement of the Prophet is in reference to this ayah. And the ayah speaks about a specific situation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ya yuhalladheena aman. إِذَا تَدَايَنْتُمْ بِدَيْنٍ إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ مُسَمَّنْ فَاكْتُبُونَ He talks about what? About loans, borrowing loans, and the rules and the guidelines for loans. He says, O you who believe, إِذَا تَدَايَنْتُمْ بِدَيْنٍ إِلَىٰ أَجَلٍ مُسَمَّنْ when you, when you borrow a loan that is to be repaid at a future date, write it down. Commit it to writing. Because a year from today, you and I may forget some of the verbal agreements we had. <clears throat> Two years from today, you and I may not be around. Our, our, what are that? our inheritors may not know of our, our verbal agreements. So Allah says, write it down. If it's written down, mistakes cannot be made. Why? Why write it down? Because brothers and sisters, one of the goals that Islam came to achieve is to protect the property of people. The property of people. Not only do you have the right to own, the right to possess, which is a fundamental democratic right by the way, but that your property is protected. It is protected. And so to protect your, your property, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered that in this matter, in this particular financial transaction, when you borrow loans, you should write it down. And the ayah goes on. It's a long ayah like I said. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the, 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 the person who should write it, how he should write, what he should write, who should dictate the terms of the agreement. Allah says, let the, the borrower dictate the terms of the agreement. Because he is the one in need. And he knows what he can afford in terms of repayments. So let him dictate the terms. Eventually, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes down to, 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 to telling us of the need for witnesses as well. Witnesses. So two people just shouldn't write the agreement. They need witnesses. They need witnesses. So that one, after a year or two, cannot accuse the other of adding in into this written document what was not there originally. You have witnesses who are witnessing that both of you agreed to this today. So Allah says, وَاسْتَشْهِدُوا شَهِيدَيْنِ مِنْ رِجَالِكُمْ and get two witnesses from among your men. فَإِن لَمْ يَكُونَا رَجُلَيْنِ فَرَجُلٌ وَمْرَأَتَانِ مِمَّنْ تَرْدَوْنَ مِنَ الشُّهَدَةِ And if you cannot find two men to be witnesses for this particular sort of transaction, and remember, the key is a particular type of financial transaction. That's what the ayah speaks to. The problem is you and I tend to generalize. But there's no evidence for that. We'll talk about that in a little bit more details just now. Hope we have time. Allah says, but if you can't find two men, then at least one man and two women. Here is the ayah that supposedly seems to say that two women equal, the testimony of two women equals that of one man. So one woman is half of a man. But remember, this is a specific situation. On top of that, brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in this ayah why, why He ordered two women in the place of one man in this particular type of transaction. Remember, Islam came to protect the wealth of people, the property of people. And Allah wants no mistakes to be made in the wealth and property of people. So he orders two women in place of one man. And he tells us why. He said, That if one of the two women errs, then the other could remind her. It is well known, brothers and sisters, and I don't know why people argue over this. It is well known that the makeup of the female gender is such that they tend to be very emotional at certain times. And this is based not on their choice, it is based on natural changes in their own bodies. This is how Allah made them. See, Allah is the one who made them. He is the creator. So He knows what He made. He knows His creations. And so He knows when there is a need to have a backup, so to speak. These are changes that Allah has decreed for women. They have no control over this. So it's no fault of theirs. See, we tend to use these ahadith and ayats to blame the women. You guys are you know, less intelligent. But the Prophet salam, as Ibn Hajar mentions in his comments on this hadith, he says these, the statement of the Prophet salam, is not intended to lay blame on the women for this, but rather it is to highlight the nature on which Allah has created women. So what the Prophet ﷺ is talking about, he's not generalizing about women. He's actually speaking about a specific situation that describes certain natures of women. Because when people become emotional, brothers and sisters, their perception of what they're seeing or hearing can be skewed, can be off mark. When we're emotional, our perception of things can change. And remember, the wealth of people is a serious thing. What would happen if two witnesses come and one says this and the other contradicts that? Serious problems. And it involves the wealth of people. Allah wants to protect that wealth. So to, He gave us a way out to ensure 
that the wealth of people, that people don't lose their wealth. Because someone's perception of what happened at the time was skewed, was off a little bit, due to no fault of theirs, of course. If you're going through emotional changes at the time, it's not your fault. But at the same time, to protect the wealth of people, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a protection against such occurrences happening. So he said, get two women. Because the likelihood of two women going through the same emotional stresses at the, at the same time is unlikely. This is unlikely. The possibility of two of them at the same time being uh, off mark in terms of their perception of what's happening, this is unlikely. One, it's possible. But two, not, not so much possible anymore. And so the order of having a second woman is simply, brothers and sisters, in this particular case of this particular type of financial transaction to ensure that the wealth of people is protected. That's what it is. So it's a reality of a particular situation. It does not apply generally to women. In fact, there are cases, brothers and sisters, where the testimony of a woman would be valid over the testimony of a man. And one woman at that, not even two. When it comes to matters relating to, let's say, the menstrual cycle. If you were to study fiqh on, on, on al hayd the menstrual cycle, you will always find that the scholars will say, Al qawlu qawluha. The wife, the woman has the final say. So there are matters in which her testimony is taken above that of a man. In addition to this, there are instances when the wives of the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam, because remember, if the hadith means women are less intelligent than men, that applies to the wives of the Prophet also. They are women. It applies to them as well. But yet we see in his own life, alayhi salatu was salam, instances, many instances of extremely intelligent decisions and choices by his wives. <coughs> and sometimes these advices were given to the Prophet himself, alayhi salam. And look at his reaction. He didn't say, hold it, you know. I'm the messenger of Allah. You're a woman. You're less intelligent. You know, why are you giving me advice? No. Subhanallah. The Prophet ﷺ treated the advice as equal to any, of, any man's advice. On Monday, I shared with you uh, uh, the example. Two examples, actually, of the Treaty of Al-Hudaybiyyah. When the Prophet ﷺ ordered the Sahaba to cut their hair and let's go back to Medina, based on the term of the treaty of Al Hudaybiyyah, and they refused. Who provided him with the, with the solution? He himself is worried, doesn't know what to really do. He's worried that Allah could punish the Muslims because they disobeyed his order as the messenger of Allah. His solution came from his own wife, radiallahu anha, Umm Salam. She said to him, O Messenger of Allah, you go out and do what you want them to do. They will follow you. What did the Prophet ﷺ do? He didn't think you're a woman. You know what, do you know? No. He turned around, went back out, and said to one of the Sahabas, Okay guys, shave my hair. He didn't tell them again, go cut your hair guys. He just said, cut my hair. And the problem was solved. All the Sahaba came and they cut their hair, mashallah. And they went back to Medina. This is a woman giving him advice. I also mentioned the example of uh, Maimuna radiallahu anha in Hajj. When people disputed, was the Prophet ﷺ fasting on the day of Arafah or not? She sent him a bowl of milk and he drank the milk in the presence of everybody. Now as I mentioned then, she could have sent someone to ask him, are you fasting or messenger of Allah? And he would have told them, yes, I am fasting or no, I'm not fasting. But if she had asked the question, only the few people who are around to hear the question and answer would know that. The, the person who is far away wouldn't know that. So the dispute would still be ongoing. But look at what she did. Look at how she, she handled the situation. Right? Look at the intelligence that she had to let even the people who were far away 
gain insight into this issue. Because with a bowl of milk, even if you're far away, you could still see him with a bowl of milk, raising it to his mouth and drinking from it. You might not be able to hear anything he's saying at such a distance. Hopefully your eyesight is good though, so you can see what he's doing. Again, it was a lady who did this. Then we have the example of Aisha radiallahu anha, one of the most brilliant of the Sahaba. She's one of the most brilliant of the Sahaba among those who are ranked as major companions in narrations of hadith. A woman. That's not all, brothers and sisters. There are examples of where Aisha radiallahu anha showed a very high level of intelligence in rationally rejecting certain statements made by some of the other male companions. Let me give you one example because we're out of time actually. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu narrated, and this hadith is in Sahih Muslim. He said that the Prophet ﷺ said that three things will break the prayer of a person if it passes in front of him. A dog, a donkey, and a woman. A dog, a donkey, and a woman. If any of these three passes in front of you while you're praying, your prayer is not on board. Aisha radiallahu anha said, when she heard the statement, she said, hold it guys. This doesn't, this doesn't make sense. Have you now equated women with dogs and donkeys? You've lured us to that level, we're now like dogs and donkeys. She said, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, used to pray in, his, in, in, in her home. And she used to be lying in front of him, in the direction of his qibla. And he used to pray and he did not break his prayer. In some hadith, to make sujood, the Prophet had to tap her on the leg so that she could move her legs out of the way. And then he would make his sujood. So she said, this statement cannot be right. Because look, she used to lie in front of the Prophet ﷺ and he used to pray and he used to even touch her. And he did not break his prayer. So how come you're saying this? So when we look at all these different incidents, we begin to realize that this one hadith cannot mean what it seems to be saying at face value. See, the point is, we have to look at the bigger picture instead of just one point in the hadith or, or one point in the picture. And that's why it's important that when we read a hadith, we do not start giving fatwa based on one hadith, but that we look at all the other statements, hadith and Quran on that issue, before you're able to come out with a ruling or a hukum. So one hadith alone is not enough to give a person uh, a full knowledge of the issue. There might be other hadith that may, that may limit certain uh, uh, individuals from within the group and so on. That's why we need to gather all the information on the issue. And then from that, we can come out with a ruling and a hukum. So I hope that inshallah, this detailed you know, look at this issue would clarify the meaning of this hadith. We still have to talk about the other part, about the defect in religion or deficiency in religion. We'll talk about that as well. But inshallah, in our next session, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of us. May He open up our hearts and minds so that we can understand this wonderful message He has revealed. And may He inspire us all to live by this message. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our hearts and minds so that we see our wives and our daughters and our mothers and our aunts and our sisters, our Muslim sisters, as equals, as people, as human beings who are intelligent beings, who have valuable ideas and advice that can make society a better place. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect, protect all of us from the deviations of shaitan. And may He protect us from engaging in the useless battles about who is better than whom. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us firm in the straight path. Aqulu qawli hadha. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.